Okay, in our video series on diabetes treatment, step by step, and emergency medicine, in this video, we'll be talking about hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state (HHS), previously called as HONK, hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma. We'll discuss that what is HHS. We'll discuss that what is the difference between hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state versus diabetic ketoacidosis. We'll discuss that what is its presentation and what are the causes of HHS. We'll discuss that how do you calculate serum osmolarity and we'll discuss that how do you treat HHS step by step. First of all, what is hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state? As its name implies that there is hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia with sugar levels above 600 mg per deciliter. Due to excess sugar accumulation in blood, the osmolarity of blood also increases. So blood is hyperosmolar with increased osmolarity. Osmolarity greater than or equal to 320 millimole per kg. With hyperglycemia and hyperosmolarity, there is dehydration in HHS. Why is there dehydration? Since there is excess glucose in the blood, body tries to push that glucose out of the body, excrete that glucose out of the body in urine. And with the loss of glucose in the urine, there is loss of water resulting in severe dehydration. Dehydration is a very important component of HHS. With dehydration, there is hypovolemia without ketoacidosis. Hypovolemia because there is loss of fluid from the body without ketoacidosis. Ketoacidosis is a point which differentiates HHS from DKA. Now we'll discuss the point of ketoacidosis in detail. Whenever there is lack of insulin, there is hyperglycemia in blood. Insulin shifts glucose from the blood into the cells of brain. Whenever there is lack of insulin, that glucose from the blood cannot be shifted into the cells of the brain. So glucose uptake in the brain cells is decreased. Whenever glucose uptake in the brain cells is decreased, there is lack of energy in the brain cells. But brain needs energy all the time. So what the brain does, brain orders the liver to produce ketone bodies. Ketone bodies are also a source of energy and those ketone bodies can be shifted into the brain cells without insulin. So liver produces ketone bodies and those ketone bodies then enter the brain without the need of insulin and those ketone bodies provide energy to the brain. But everything comes at a cost. These ketone bodies are actually acids. These are called as keto acids. So there is buildup of acid in the blood. That is called as ketoacidosis. So there will be hyperglycemia with ketoacidosis that is called as diabetic ketoacidosis. Now compare it with the second case. In the second case, there is hyperglycemia in the blood, increased glucose in the blood, but there is sufficient insulin, small little amount of insulin that is present in the blood that inhibits the production of ketone bodies from the liver. Remember, even if there is small amount of insulin present in the blood, that small amount of insulin does not let liver produce ketone bodies. It says that I am there in the blood. I have to do this job. I have to transport glucose into the brain cells. Then why ketone bodies are being produced from the liver? So insulin inhibits ketone body production from the liver. So on this side, there was total lack of insulin. There was total lack of insulin, therefore ketone bodies were produced. But on the right side, there is some small little amount of insulin present in the blood that inhibits ketone body production from the liver. But that small little amount of insulin cannot control blood glucose levels. So the, the insulin is not enough to control blood glucose levels, but that small little insulin can inhibit ketone body production from the liver. So that small little insulin that is present in the blood is not doing its own job and it is not letting the liver produce ketone bodies. So that is a condition in which you will see hyperglycemia without ketoacidosis. That is called as HHS, hyperosmolar 
hyperglycemic state without ketoacidosis hypovolemia without ketoacidosis coming to the precipitating factors and presentation of hhs precipitating factors include infection mi poor compliance to the treatment cerebrovascular accidents and these infections and poor compliance to the treatment are the two most important and the most common causes of hhs and hhs might be the first presentation of diabetes and the point where they get diagnosed Presentation of HHS is very vague. A diabetic patient might come to you in ER and may complain of muscle cramps, confusion, fatigue, profound weakness. And when you check the blood glucose levels, their blood glucose level have shot up up to 700. So that might be the presentation of HHS and other classical features of diabetes with weight loss, polydipsia, polyuria. Coming to the management of HHS. HHS management is almost the same as DKA management with slight differences. I have talked about DKA management in detail in my video on uh, diabetic ketoacidosis treatment. You can check out the link in the description below. Coming to the management, first of all, we have a stepwise plan running through the investigations to the treatment. You check the blood glucose levels of the patient and the patient has blood glucose levels greater than 600 milligram per deciliter. Then you check the serum ketones. And you also go for urinary ketones in HHS. We did not prefer urinary ketone in DKA, but in HHS, we also go for urinary ketones. We check serum ketones, we check urinary ketones, and urinary ketones are in normal ranges. They are not raised because there is no ketoacidosis. You send electrolytes, you send the ABGs, and you look for the cause, you look for the precipitating factor. And according to the history of the patient, you look for, search out for the infections, you go for chest x-ray, you do ECG to look for MI, you do LFTs, troponins, blood culture, CBC, RFTs, depending upon the history, you select the investigation and try to search the cause because you want to treat the cause as well whatever is precipitating HHS. Then when your electrolytes are back, RFTs are back, and you have the blood glucose levels, you calculate the serum osmolarity. As I said, the serum osmolarity will be high. The serum osmolarity will be up because that is what makes HHS hyperosmolar. Serum, you calculate serum osmolarity through 2 into sodium levels plus glucose in mg per deciliter. In this formula, you put glucose in mg per deciliter divided by 18 plus BUN, which is the urea level in mg per deciliter divided by 2.8 and you get an answer. Normally, the serum osmolarity is between 270 to 290. But in these patients, you would find the serum osmolarity to be above 320 milliosmol per kg. The, they are hyperosmolar. So they have hyperosmolarity with hyperglycemia and no ketones. That is HHS. You pass two IV lines and you start IV 0.9% normal saline. As I said, the dehydration is the most important component of HHS. And it is also the most important part of the treatment of HHS. De correcting dehydration is the main priority in HHS. Usually, the typical deficits in these patients, a 70 kg adult would have a typical deficit of 8 to 15 liters. So you have to correct it with fluid replacement. You give lots and lots of fluid so that this hyperosmolarity that has accumulated due to hyperglycemia and diuresis, you correct it with fluid replacement. Then you start first acting insulin at low dose, 0.05 unit per kg to 0.1 unit per kg, or you can simply start an infusion at three units per hour. Remember, insulin is not the main part of treatment of HHS. It's the fluid replacement, which is the main part of the treatment. Proper fluid replacement can correct hyperglycemia and it can also correct hyperosmolarity. So insulin is started when you are unable to control blood glucose level despite giving fluids. In that case, you give insulin and you start an insulin infusion. Now you have started the patient on insulin, you have started the patient on fluid replacement and you check the blood glucose every hourly. Slowly and gradually, the blood glucose levels are coming down and you check the electrolytes. Now there are two things that you have to do after some time you have to do potassium replacement. You have to do potassium replacement because when you are giving insulin, that insulin drives the potassium in the blood into the cells. 
so after some time the potassium levels will also go down with the lowering blood glucose levels so you have to give potassium in that case when do you give potassium you check the blood potassium you do the electrolytes and if the potassium level is greater than 5.5 no action is needed but if the potassium is within the normal range 3.5 to 5.5 millimole per liter you give potassium in that you give potassium because if you do not give potassium now when the potassium is in the normal ranges after a few hours the patient will be in hypokalemia because you have started the patient on insulin infusion and that insulin will drive this normal potassium into the cells and there will be no potassium left in the blood so you have to give potassium when the potassium is within the normal ranges you give 40 millimole per liter you take a 1 liter normal saline you put 2 ampules of potassium in it and you start it at a rate of 20 millimole per hour if the potassium level is less than 3.5 millimole per liter, then it means that you have missed that small window of normal potassium and you did not give the potassium at the right time. Now you have to replace potassium rapidly and rapid replacement of potassium should be done in ICU through a central line. And I have talked about potassium replacement in detail in my video on hypokalemia. You can check out the video in the description. The other thing that you have to do is that when the blood glucose levels fall below 252 milligram per deciliter, you have to switch the patients to 10% dextrose. Because if you do not give dextrose at this point, this patient will go into hypoglycemia. Other than that, we have a loose mark for glucose levels because a very rapid correction, very sudden drop in glucose level can precipitate cerebral edema. So you replace potassium and you give dextrose when the blood glucose is less than 252. And another important point to remember in HHS is that in hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, there is hyperosmolarity and hyperosmolarity makes blood hypercoagulable because the blood is more viscous. So in that case, you have to give low molecular weight heparin to all patients except those who have contraindication for heparin. You have to give heparin to all patients to prevent them from developing strokes, from developing DVTs because they are in a hypercoagulable state when they are in HHS. Resolution of HHS is said to have occurred when the glucose levels are less than 300 mg per deciliter. Plasma osmolarity has also gone down below 315 millimole per kg because you are, your glucose levels have gone down, your sodium has gone down because of the fluid replacement, so your plasma osmolarity also goes down. An improvement in the mental state and vitals of the patient. That patient is said to have resolved from HHS. And before stopping the insulin infusion, you administer subcutaneous insulin to provide a basal control of the blood glucose levels. In summary, we talked about what is HHS. We talked about difference of HHS and DKA. We talked about precipitating factor, the clinical presentation, and the stepwise management plan, calculating serum osmolarity, passing to IV lines, giving fluids, giving insulin, potassium replacement, blood glucose replacement, heparin administration, and resolution of the patient from HHS. If you liked my video, please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on diabetes treatment step-by-step -step and emergency medicine playlist. The link of those videos is given in the description below. Thank you very much.